Praise God. All right. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 5 this morning. I know we had, we had kind of started a series, and I don't even know that I'm going to finish the book, but I kind of felt like I at least wanted to get to this part here. All right. Here we are. Galatians 5. We're going to read verses 1 through 26. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith, which worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion comes not of him that calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I, I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an, for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I just wanted to kind of stop there for a second because... There's a lot of things that are in this chapter that I liked, but I really didn't put in any of my notes uh, to to talk about. But you know, as we've covered as we've covered Galatians up to this point, we talked about really what the the underlying context was in relation to. And I don't mean to continue to you know be so redundant that you get tired of hearing it. But it was because of false doctrine. False teachers had come in behind the Apostle Paul and, and seeded the church with false doctrine. A lot of times false doctrine starts off small, but that's when he says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Jesus talked about the leaven of the Pharisees. What he was talking about was their false teaching. And that it comes in and, it, and, and you don't even really realize because leaven is yeast, is the same thing as yeast. And yeast, all it takes is a pinch and it begins to ferment. That's what yeast does. It begins to ferment and it takes over the whole lump. Even in the Old Testament, the concept of yeast and in the New Testament both is regarding something evil or sinful and specifically regarding false teachings. And, and that's, that's what he was talking about. But he was one thing that was interesting in verse 11, he said, he said, if I preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then he says, for then is the offense of the cross ceased. One of the things that we need to understand is, is that the, the message of the cross is an offense. Many times the message of the gospel is very offensive to ears that aren't aware of the liberty that the Lord purchased for us when he died on the cross. Amen. And so the reality of it is, is that even in the modern church, or especially in the modern church, you, many, you are not necessarily, just because you hear the word cross, and I know many of you are familiar with what I'm about to say, but let me just say it again. Just because you hear the word cross, just because you hear the word sin, just because you hear the word blood. Now, I'm glad if people are actually saying sin and blood and cross in your church or at churches or whoever you're flipping through the channel and you're watching on television. But that does not mean that they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And what I mean by that is, is that many times people will say, well, hold on a second. My, the preacher that I like to watch on television, he says that it ha requires faith in Christ and what he did for us at the cross in order for us to get to heaven. That's where most people are. That wasn't the issue in, in the churches of Galatia. He said, you did run well. Who hindered you? The point was is that whenever they first got saved, they got saved through faith in Christ and what he had done for them on the cross. But then now as they continued on in their Christian journey, something else has come in. A new doctrine has come in. A doctrine that focuses on something other than what Jesus did at the cross. In order for you to have proper faith, to have the grace flowing in your life from the Holy Spirit to strengthen and encourage and empower you. What I'm trying to say is that for them, it was circumcision. But, but listen to me close. And I've had a lot of arguments with a lot of preachers about this kind of thing in the past. For them, it was circumcision. Ain't no preacher today standing behind them. Now, I'm not saying that there's none, but it, it, it ain't, 
it's not very likely that they're over here preaching that you need to be circumcised. But what they are many times in the modern church preaching is some new fad, some new thing that diverts attention from what God's gospel really says to something new. And even just, I don't even really pay attention anymore to what's going on. The last time that I paid attention to what was going on in the, church, in the modern church was this thing called contemplative prayer. And I'm sure that it's still there. But there was the government of 12. Okay, there was the purpose driven life. Why do you want to pick on them? Because what I'm trying to say is, is that there's always new fads that are coming through that look very spiritual because they have scripture in them. But the reality of it is, is that it's a diversion of moving one's eyes and faith away from God's true plan and prescription for victory towards something else. The government of 12 was just a thing where they would they would have cell groups. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you would start you would start off with 12 people and, and then and then it would grow and then they'd split off into 12 more cell groups in and of themselves or home Bible study wasn't the problem. I even talked to Brother Larson about that way back in when I first started going to the camp meetings. I said I said because they were coming against that. I was like, well, hold on a second. Having church in your house can't be the problem because the early church started in houses. So that can't be the problem. The problem is, is because that's not really what they were doing. They weren't coming to people's houses to truly dig and divide and to dissect the word of God and to learn the word of God. And under the under the ministry of a person who's been called to teach and to preach the gospel. But in reality, what they were doing was they were building church growth. Completely different story, completely different scenario. It sounds to the heart and the mind like a good thing. People are more comfortable in someone's house. Well, I didn't even plan to get off on this. But I'm trying. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. It's a, it's a different focal point. The purpose-driven life. Next thing you know, behind the pulpit, everybody's teaching Rick Warren's book from behind the pulpit. Besides the fact that he had quotes from all kind of secular people in there, people that were even involved in the occult, psychologists, and all this other kind of stuff. Besides all of that, the focal point was not what it was supposed to be as far as for how you were to have victory. As a matter of fact, his plan for sanctification completely d disregarded the cross and talked about something that you were going to do. That's what the, the, the false teachers were teaching those in Galatia. And so the point that what he's talking about is still relevant for us today. It's very relevant for us today because if you're sitting under or you're allowing yourself, and you know, I used to like the way that, you know, Robert and I used to talk about this a lot too. Sometimes people don't even realize it, but there's a danger when you allow yourself to sit under a ministry that is not preaching the truth because there is a spirit of deception behind the word that's coming forth. Yeah. Spirit of deception blinds the eyes, it plugs the ears from being able to truly to be able to see the truth. Anybody in here that does feel like they have a revelation of the, the, what we're calling the, the finished work of Christ. To, to sum it up, anybody that feels as though they have a true revelation of that can admit that there was a period of time in their life where they, where they were kind of blinded to it. Like, in other words, I can tell you that there's people in here that have been coming to the Bible study off and on for quite some time. And whenever you would first hear this message that says faith in Christ, the same way you received him, so shall you continue to walk in him. Everything that you heard from the preacher when he would preach it sounded right to the heart. The heart would say, yes, amen. Yes, amen. That's got to be right. My spirit feels that this is, this is what the Holy Spirit would have me to understand and to know. But at the same time, there was a disconnect. It wasn't quite right. I understood it here, but it never had truly come home here. I know Cynthia used to tell me, I was talking to her when I first got a revelation of it. She lived in Austin. And I would sit there and I would talk to her and I'd feed her all this stuff. Lord, help these people because I was getting so much revelation and I'm over here just rattling it off like a, like a robot. And now I realize, I don't know, anyway. <laughs> But, but also, there were times after I had told her all these things that she moved down here or she would come visit and I would, she would sit down with my sister Debbie. My sister Debbie had been reading the Bible forever. My sister Debbie taught me all kinds of things about the Bible. But yet at the same time, she would say and they would have a conversation whenever I would leave. She, Cynthia's told me before, it's almost like every time he leaves, 
while he's sitting here talking about it, my, my mind is saying yes, 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 yes. And as soon as he leaves and he quits talking about it, it's like it's gone. It's the foul, it's the foul of the air. You, you understand that's the representative of Satan. When the seed, a sower went out to sow and some fell along the wayside and the fowl of the air came and they stole the seed. The fowl of the air in that parable that Jesus is talking about is Satan himself coming to steal the seed so that the heart of man cannot get the revelation of it. And so essentially, that's what these false teachers were doing in Galatia. But I want you to know it's not just circumcision. It's not just rules and regulations. It's anything that diverts our attention and our focal point away from Jesus Christ and him crucified to any other message, to any other word that is not the word of the gospel, right? Yeah. All right. And, and I like the fact that he says, for then is the offense of the cross ceased. I'm going to tell you right now, that is one of the reasons why a lot of people won't preach the truth. I, I've heard people say before that, oh, yeah, that, that church over there, that's that swagger church. And that's fine. If that's what people want to, if that's how people want to associate, associate our church. Even whenever I was going to the old church that I used to go to, they, I, we were teaching the Bible study. And their focal point of what they want, they wanted me to come teach a Bible study at the church. But, but the problem that I had was, even in their pamphlet, because I mean we had about 650 people going strong in, in Franklin whenever it was going good. They want, they, it was the addiction recovery class is what they wanted to call it. And finally, I got to the point where I'm like, dude, you know what? I don't mean to, I don't mean to be sound frustrated, but y'all keep focusing on the fact that y'all want Matt to be the addiction recovery class. This is what the whole church needs. Do y'all get what I'm trying? This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why is that so confusing? The gospel liberates. We don't need to have some 12-step program that has scripture intertwined in it. There's a one-step program. You come to the foot of the cross and you keep your faith there. And when you do, the Holy Spirit goes to work for you. Amen? Not you working some program. Not somebody else fixing your issues or, you know, oh, but we want to be able to espouse our problems. No, I get that. Look, we all want to be able to talk about that. And I'm not saying that there's not a place or a time for that. I'm not saying that there's not, but let me tell you something. You and I sitting across the coffee table from each other and talking about the things that we're going through, it might help you to cleanse some of the things that you're going through. And I'm not completely opposed. That's what good friends in the Lord are for. But it's not going to heal you. It's not going to deliver you. Amen? Your accountability partner, like they called it. I'm really going off. None of this was in the message. Your accountability partner, like they called it, is not going to remedy the root of the situation that is on the inside. These are band-aid effects that only cover up the problem. What the message of the cross does, what Jesus Christ and him, the covenant, the new covenant, the gospel, amen, the finished work of Christ, what it does is it allows the Holy Spirit to do the work that only the Holy Spirit can do. Amen. Man can't fix man. That's what Matt Darden said last week. Man can't fix man. Only God can fix man. Amen. Praise God. All right. So it takes away the persecution of the cross. That's what I'm trying to say. I mean, the offense of the cross. The cross is offensive to the religious mind. The cross is offensive to the world. Because the message of the cross says, if you're in the world and you're doing this and you like doing this, then that part of you has to die because God isn't good with that. And to religion, it says all of your works that you've been trying to present before God like Cain has to die, has to go to the wayside because that's not what God's accepting. Your government of 12, your purpose driven, whatever it is that you're focused on and you're so proud about, listen, it's not, it, God's not going to bless it. Once again, if you're having Bible studies if you're a big church and you got home Bible studies during the week and you have people that are called by the Lord to teach the message of the cross or to teach the gospel to people, praise God. There's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, I wish we had it and started doing it. Amen? But what I'm trying to say is anything that's diverting attention away from what God's plan is, is essentially what was going on over here in the book of Galatians. And he goes on to say here, he says, uh, <clears throat> I would 
they were even cut off, which trouble you. Now, now I'm going to shut up after this and go back to reading. But you know what he's actually saying right there? He's actually saying these Judaizers that came in after me, that planted this leaven in your lump. You know what I wish they would do? Now, I hope, you know, we're PG-13 in here, right? Okay. <laughs> I wish they would castrate themselves. That's what, he, that's what the meaning in the Greek is. And then when he says cut themselves off, because see what they were teaching was circumcision. But he said, no, what they really need to do is they need to actually make the member dysfunctional to where they can't procreate children of the flesh anymore. Yeah. That's what I wish they would do. If they think that circumcision is going to make things better, then what they need to do is they, they need to just go all the way with it. <laughs> and just and mutilate. He lay, in another book, he calls them mutilators. They're mutilators because it's not a true circumcision, which was spiritual, which was a circumcision of the heart that happened through the spirit, through conversion, when you gave your heart to the Lord. Amen. All right. He says, um, for brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. In other words, you can see them. They're adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you, I tell you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, one important point is, is that we've got to understand something. He's talking about consistent, repetitive behavior. He's talking about somebody that lives a lifestyle like this, right? Many of us have lived a lifestyle like this in the past. Some in the church have even fallen back into certain aspects of, that were listed here. But at the same time, because the Holy Spirit lives in them, the Lord pulls them back out. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people that continue on in a lifestyle like this that, that, that and, and thinking that this is perfectly, that, that they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen? All right. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. You know, I kept finding some commonalities in this passage of Scripture that kept leading me to understand that he was talking about more than just the lust of the flesh that we tend to think of. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know about you, but you can get caught in a trap. We can get caught in a trap as believers that when we think of the lust of the flesh, we look at them first ones, man. We look at, we look at, you know, adultery and fornication. Like, oh, check that off. I'm not doing that. Don't do that anymore. Uh, witchcraft. Well, if you know what the word witchcraft means, it's actually pharmakia in the Greek and it's describing drug use. Because in the occult world back in those days, the sorcerers would use drugs in order to lower the threshold to allow demon spirits to be active in the situation. Especially whenever they were trying to read, like, well, for instance, that girl, whenever the Apostle Paul and Silas, if you'll remember, and she was following them, these men be of the Lord. And she was telling the truth, but she was, had a disruptive spirit. She had a spirit of python. That's what the word was in the Greek. And because she came from a specific temple where they were trained to engage in sorcery, to read people's minds or whatever, I say read people's minds to foretell their future, they do these, they did that through demon spirits. Mm -hmm. And the use of drugs allowed them to function more easy because the devil likes that kind of stuff, okay? And, and the apostle Paul turned around and rebuked it. 
Remember that? And she became, she couldn't, she couldn't function anymore. And they ended up throwing them in prison. The point being is that, well, I don't do that. I don't do drugs anymore. But guess what? There were other things listed here that sometimes we don't see. And the reality of it is, is that in this faith, in this journey, there are still things in our life. Even though we understand the message of the cross, even though we're walking with the Lord, even though we love God, even though our faith is right, things that are in us that sometimes we can't see it ourselves. I'm telling you, the whole, I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit never pricked your heart about it. I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit never whispered in your ear about it and kind of gave you a, well, maybe that's not quite right. But these are things that are easy to kind of brush off. But you understand what I'm saying? Kind of, and especially when you compare them to the other things. It's like, well, I'm not doing that. Right. And so we justify in our hearts and in our minds. But what the Lord is wanting us to do is to get to the place where we hear his voice and we obey. Amen. And we're even in the little things. Does that make sense? Amen. Praise God. All right. So previously, the Apostle Paul had described the law as a guardian. Remember that the law was a schoolmaster to lead and guide Israel to the point where Jesus would come. And he also described the law is a mother that gave birth to children of bondage. Remember that? We, we, we compared and contrasted Sarah, which was a type of the new covenant, and Hagar, which was a type of the law, and that Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. And, and, and the way Paul described it was Ishmael was a child of the flesh, a child that was born into bondage. So if people today want to live according to some other gospel, some other twist on the gospel that doesn't put the focal point on Jesus Christ and him crucified, where the Holy Spirit says, this was the eternal plan of God. This is where I can, this is where I'm willing to work and instead put their faith somewhere else. Then the result of that is going to be children of bondage instead of children of liberty. Now he describes the law as a yoke of bondage or slavery. Let's go back and look at Galatians 5. Verses 1 through 4. He says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. In other words, if you think circumcision is going to make you right with God, that's not enough. You can't stop there. You got to do the whole law. You got to keep the whole thing. And I can promise you, even if you never committed adultery, never committed murder, if you say you never stole, but the reality of it is, is that we probably all stole a piece of bubble gum. If you say you never bore false witness, when you get to the end, brother, you're going to have some problems because you have coveted something in your life. You have coveted someone that you weren't supposed to covet in your life. Something like that has happened and you broke the law. Therefore, you will stand guilty before God. Because if you're not going to keep the whole law, then it doesn't work. You can't just keep. It's like a cafeteria. You know what I'm saying? I remember my daddy used to bring me to this cafeteria in Texas. He said, I'm not going to tell you exactly what he said, but it was something like, you can take all you want, but you sure enough, blankety blank, going to eat everything you take. <laughs> okay? That's just, and then he wasn't being mean. He was just how he talk. But you can pick and choose. Yeah, I picked three entrees. You know, I want the fish, I want the meat, and I want the, you know, you pick and choose. You take what you want, you just leave the rest. That's kind of how some people are whenever they live under rules and regulations. They pick the little rules that they want to keep, and they want other people to keep, but then they just kind of forget about the other ones, that, and they leave it up there on the cafeteria line. That's not how it works according to the law. You're not going to, you can't be righteous before God that way. Amen. We can only be righteous before God because of what Jesus did. Amen. Amen. He goes on to say, you're a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. If you try to live for God that way, then Christ now has become of no effect to you. Whosoever you are that are trying to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. I think that that's a very important passage of scripture right there. Because many times we kind of misquote that, and I think I have it in my notes here. But first off, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the yoke. He said, don't become entangled again with a yoke of bondage. We talk about the yoke a lot, right? Many times I've, I've, I've preached a message about the yoke, um, and I mention it oftentimes. You know, the yoke was an instrument that was used, usually made of wood, to, to attach two beasts of burden that would work in order to gain more power, in order to accomplish more work, right? But once you yoke these animals together, and animals generally anyway, are under the control of something else, 
Jesus said in the book of Matthew, he said, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, in that scenario, what Jesus is saying is, come and willingly submit yourself to my yoke. Come and willingly yoke yourself to me. Come into union with me. And the way we do that is through faith in him and what he did. The old man dies is buried and is resurrected anew. Now we're implanted with the divine nature. Now we're in union with Christ. But walk that way with me. Submit your life to me. And when you do that, you're going to find that my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You will find rest for your weary soul. Now the Holy Spirit is going to work for you. Amen. But that's a willing submission to the Lord. But what the Apostle Paul is warning against is the fact that if we're not careful, we can entangle ourselves to bondage, a yoke of bondage, by diverting our focus off of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, the true gospel, onto some other whatever the new fat is that's going on in the church. And so the thought, once again, is that believers can become entangled again in bondage. And that word entangled means ensnared. I don't know, I think a lot about sometimes, I guess... Marine biology still because my daughter's in marine biology, but I know that some I think about these fish sometimes or these dolphins. You know, people fishermen's line. I've heard stories about that. It'll get wrapped around their fin. And sometimes they're dragging it around them, and it can like cause circulation problems. But it, not only that, it can kind of get them caught on other things, and they get stuck. That, that's ensnared. You can't move. Or maybe for us, things that get tangled up under our feet. Who all went to LumCon yesterday? Y'all went to LumCon. Everybody went to LumCon, so y'all are y'all are groovy with the whole fish illustration. That's some lab in Cocodry or whatever, and they had some big deal. And so anyway, but ensnared can also be entangled. Something wrapped around your feet and prevent you from walking right. You're trying to run. Well, what about remember them three-legged race things that they used to do, or however? You, you can't move. And that's what the Apostle Paul was warning: Don't get entangled or ensnared again through a yoke of slavery by connecting yourself to the law. You know, and then he goes on to say that you fall from grace when you do that. I just wanted to make the point that whenever a person sins, whether you're a Christian or really even non-believers, grace is for sinners. Grace is for saints that sin. You don't fall away. People say, oh man, that brother, that preacher there fell from grace. No, you're really supposed to fall into grace. You fall from grace when you change the object of your faith. You understand what I'm saying? Grace is to repair people. Grace is to forgive people. Grace is to strengthen people. Grace is to heal people. You don't fall from grace when you fail God. That's what God gave the whole plan for, was to heal people that fall. Amen? But instead, we fall from grace when we change spheres. I don't mean to get all fancy on you, but, you know, a sphere is like, a, it, it is considered like an orb, if you will. But, you know, one is law, one is grace. If you're born again in Christ, then you're in the, you're in the sphere of grace. You're in Him. Amen? But if you change the object of your faith and you come back to law, now... You're on your own and you've changed the, the sphere. I, I, I like to use the word sphere, but I think of, I think of atmosphere. And I've told you all that before, that it's like whenever you get saved, it's like you moved into a new neighborhood. And the neighborhood where you live now, there's grace in the air. Amen. Grace is moving and operating in your life because you've put faith in the right thing. Amen. And you're keeping faith in the right thing. And so now God's grace is moving and operating. Right. He's been talking about the law, but he's also talks about the fact that grace is for liberty and not license. In other words, don't use your liberty as an occasion. Because listen, Christians can also open up the door by willingly going back to sin. Don't think that everybody in this room in some way, shape or form has done some form of a sin that they knew that they weren't supposed to do. And I'm not trying to tell you that if you mess up one time or whatever the case, that you're automatically going to find yourself in bondage again. But that's the first step towards it. The first step towards becoming entangled and ensnared is when you take that step towards it. 
And at some point in time, it can become to the point where, again, you are ensnared. Now, you know, this transitions well to verse 7. If you put verse 7 up there, I'm talking about the entangled part. I'm talking about the visual of the rope bound up between our feet because then the Apostle Paul goes into this race illustration. He says, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? The idea, like I said, of entangled or ensnared goes well with this because he's painting the picture of a runner in a race and he states you were running so well. In other words, when you got saved, you were in the right, you were in the race and you were doing the right thing, but somebody hindered you. Now, in the ancient Greek games, whenever they would run, they had to run in one lane. That was the lane that they had to run in. And so for the Christian, when he gets saved, he's supposed to stay in one lane. The lane of grace, the lane of faith and grace. But then when it says someone hindered you, the idea is that the, another runner, an opposer, came and cut you off. They weren't supposed to do that, but Lord knows every, people don't do what they're supposed to do. And so whenever he cut them off, it caused them to veer off track. You weren't supposed to veer off track. You were supposed to stay in the lane. Each and every one of us in this place can remember some point in time when we felt like we were running the race well. And then some opposer, whether it be a person, whether it be something, a circumstance, a trial, a tribulation, came in and cut us off. That's what the word literally means, a cut off, and caused us to veer off and to get in another lane. You can't finish the race in that other lane. If the journey is going to be completed, it's going to have to be completed in the right lane. Amen. Amen. In the case of the Galatians, the problem, once again, were the false teachers. But for us, we can remember a time in our own lives that something like that has happened. Mm -hmm. um, Paul is going to close this letter by reminding them what the lane is. Let's look at Galatians 6.14. He says, but, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified to me and me into the world. If you look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 real quick. So while we're switching there, the Apostle Paul saying that the world. Now you understand when we, when we use the terminology of world, it's not just talking about this orb that we live on, this rock called earth. It's talking about the system that's actually under the dominion and control. This evil age is under the dominion and control of Satan. Jesus called him the prince of this earth. You may not like to hear that, but Jesus himself recognized the fact that Satan has authority during this age. This earth is done belong to him. This earth was created. It, really, it belongs to Jesus. And Adam was given the opportunity to tend and keep it. But because of his failure, now sin has given a legal right to Satan during this evil age. But this evil age ain't lasting forever. All right. There's coming a day when God's going to put an end to it. But this, but, but the apostle Paul said the world was crucified to me and I to the world because of the cross. When you look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 16 through 17, it says for all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes and the pride of life. There's things my eyes see that it likes. There's things that my flesh wants that it knows. It just says, oh, that's going to feel so good. And there's things that the world offers that I want. The pride of life. In other words, if I see your, I mean, Gowdy clown me this morning. He's like, where's your belt, dude? You forgot your belt. I was trying to like roll without a belt for a couple of weeks just to see something new. And I guess I'm going to start wearing my belt again. But, but, the, but the point that I'm trying to make is, is that, I mean, I'm not looking to Gowdy to give me a sense of fashion. But at the same time, I, I was just messing with you. But at the same time, that many times the world will influence us that way. I see somebody driving a particular car, more people driving cars like that. I look at my own car and I'm like, golly, man. You need a new car. You know? Or I see somebody with these other clothes. You, you understand? The pride of life. I, I start to view what everybody else around me is doing and, and, I, and I don't feel confident in who I am in Christ. You know, There's a couple of reasons that I don't really buy new cars. 
I've shared that before. My girls know it. You know, when I've shared the story before, but when I used to bring them to home a Christian, one of their classmates, one of Sierra's classmates says, oh, look, look, Sierra's daddy dropping her off in Buku Ratchet. That's what they call my club. <laughs> Buku means much, for it, in case you didn't know that. Ratchet. <laughs> they call my car Buku Ratchet. And I'm like, you know what? That just encourages me. I'm going to continue <laughs> to drive this car. Even my boss one time, like, we don't pay our nurse practitioner enough money to buy our hubcaps. That's how I roll, bro. You know? And, 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 you know, and I still got, I got a new car, and it still got bumps all over it. And that's, that's the issue. I don't, I don't think I deserve a new car. Maybe one day when I feel like I deserve a new car, I'll buy me a new one. But I can't say that, I'm going off on a rabbit trail, but I can't say that when I sit in a brand new car with brand new leather, and take a sniff. Damn, hey, come on. I ain't crazy. But the point is, I'm trying to make a, a, a case for the pride of life. There's th but all of those things are of the world. I'm not saying that you can't have a nice car. That's not what I'm saying. But if it's driving you, yeah. right, in the wrong direction because you're so caught up in that, right, <laughs> then, then it's, it's not right. because That's another spirit. It's, it, it's the spirit of the world. They get us through the commercials and they try to convince us that we're not happy because we don't have what everybody else has. It's not the spirit. It doesn't come from the Lord. That's what it says right here. He says, the pride of life. All these things are not of the Father, but it's of the world. The world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God, amen, shall abide forever. So there's things that this world is offering, but the Apostle Paul said, hey, I was crucified to the world and the world was crucified to me. Through what Jesus did at the cross, that's the lane I got to stay in if I'm going to finish this race, all right? Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. He says, uh, for brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the love is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. So you see there that one of the big concepts of this little passage of scripture right here has to do with the fact that love is manifest in our service towards one another. A big part of the kingdom of God is that we would love one another. People say that some of the church fathers, I haven't read a lot of them, but I've talked to Aaron, a bit. he's got a whole volume on them. And I used to talk to this other guy at the old church that we went to that was into the church fathers. And they said, you know, John was the last living disciple. John was the, la the last living disciple that had walked with the Lord. And they would say that when he was really old, they would, they would have church out by this tree and they would kind of help him get out there and they'd kind of lean him up against the tree and they it, sometimes he would just say like one word and tears would just start rolling down his face and then tears would start rolling down everybody else's face and he would just say love love one another for that is what he did for us and it was so powerful that it just gripped everybody's heart the love of God God is love amen and God's love manifests itself in God's people. And so when we serve God and serve the kingdom of God, amen, we end up serving one another with love. Amen. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But then he look, look what he says. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. So the love is supposed to be the manifestation of what the true child of God looks like. But obviously in Galatia, they were, they were dealing with Problems where they were devouring one another. I mean, I see a picture of a, of a wolf pack, ravenous wolves, trying to destroy one another. Yeah, you know, sometimes people in the faith get in quarrels. You know, we don't always see eye to eye. But sometimes, man, even people in the church, now that's messed up. You know, that you start being malicious and start trying to trying to really mess people up. That that's not of the Lord. Amen. The result of grace is that it liberates us to live for the Lord. Grace is given to the believer by the Holy Spirit and empowers him to live for God. This is the opposite of serving oneself. One of the things that we got to understand is flesh serves self. The spirit 
is serving the Lord, right? And it's obvious that, that the Christians in Galatia were, were dealing with some of this. And we've spoken about this many times, but the Lord is so different than us, okay? And this, this is the kind of stuff that I think about. Whenever God reveals Matt's heart to Matt, this is what, you know what, I've come to the realization, man, God, Jesus was a whole lot different than I am. That's why I'm supposed to be decreasing and he's supposed to be increasing, right? He was so different than us in that he laid his life down because it was the Father's will. It was the Father's will that Jesus died. And so he laid his life down, he served with his life, and his motives were always pure. Sometimes we think our motives are pure. I'm just saying. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Don't let the preacher just preach to himself. Sometimes we think our motives are pure, but the reality of it is, is that there's a lot of times, even Brother Larson used to say this a lot, that a lot of times there's a whole lot more flesh than there is faith in us. Mm -hmm. And we think sometimes more highly of ourselves than what we ought to. And there's things on the inside of us that the Lord's wanting to deal with. Once he gets rid of the lust and the fornication and the drunkenness and the drugs and all these kind of stuff that, you know, now he's trying to get down to where he's doing that microsurgery. Remember that game called Operation? <laughs> you know? Yeah, he's getting down there to the nitty gritty. He's starting to deal with those personality flaws and all of that kind of stuff like that that is offensive towards people. Lord, if I've offended, I'm, I'm saying, if I've offended any of y'all at some point in time since you started this church, forgive me because Lord knows I can still do that. Okay, and I mean, if I ever did anything that you didn't like, I mean, it might have been an issue on your part, too. I mean, hello, newsflash, right? It ain't always the preacher that does everything wrong, but I'm willing to admit that I still do stuff wrong. And so if I offended you, please forgive me. Amen. As long as we all are willing to make restitution and come to the reconciliation and the fact that we all got issues. All right. Amen. Is that OK for me to say that? All right. But there's sometimes in the church, it's not always like we're like ravenous wolves trying to destroy people. Sometimes people just quietly do things in the church. Ways to, to, to subvert, manipulate, di different things like that. They quietly do things to serve themselves and their own interests. Jesus didn't say, well, okay, Father, if you do things this way, you know, and, and, you, and you handle the business this way, then I'll go ahead and go to the cross. No, he didn't ask all that. He didn't. There wasn't no stipulations. Father, you know, if it's possible, let this come pass. But nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. So the, the question for the Christian in every situation is what is the will of God in this? Now, that's why we got the word of God. You can't just go cafeteria on this either. It says what it says. And you got to come to the right conclusion and then you got to follow. Amen. I can't we can't sit here and the preacher hit every single little thing, but we can sure try as best we can. But that's going to take us a while. We got to study the scripture for ourselves. Amen. And let the word of God speak. Right. So he trusted and served. And the point is that love and service result in unity. Unity is very important. It's important that we're all on the same page and work together towards what the Lord has called us to do here, too. I'm talking about our church here. And the reason I say that is because a lot of times I talk about the big picture, and I really do believe that way. I know that we're not here to build just a local church. I've always been king more kingdom-minded. That's why I even made that comment the other night when I let somebody come in and preach from another church. <clears throat> you know, because I know he doesn't come to our church, but it's obvious that he has a call of God on his life. Of course, I'd rather come to our church, but that's between him and the Lord. Amen. You don't even have to strike that from the tape. Oh, God, he watches the videos. I'd rather you come to this church. But guess what? Even if you don't, I'm still going to use you if you keep preaching like that. Amen. Amen. Because the calling of God is on his life. Amen. Amen. Um, but what I am trying to say is at the same time, God has called us to do some stuff here. Amen. And it can't be neglected. Right. And so while this letter was written to a specific church regarding specific circumstances, it transcends time. Amen. And it's living word for us today. Right. For the church of all ages. And there are practical ministries that have to be tended to here. Bills that have to be paid here. Plans for the future that have to be financed here. And if we're not working together, it just makes us makes it all that harder to accomplish the end result. Right. And, and um, you know. Let's let's look at uh, Galatians five sixteen through 17. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh 
lust against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. The flesh of man and the spirit of God within the man are at war with one another. Until glorification, like Matt said, sanctification, right? It's a process. And, and there's still two natures present, and the two natures are at conflict with one another. The flesh is not talking about the external body here. It's talking about the, the, the part of man that's tainted by sin. The fleshly desires of the man that wants what he wants, that wants to serve himself, right? And I talked about, I, I wanted to make the point because this is some of the stuff that the Lord has dealt with me about. And when I was writing this message, I remembered even at the other church that I used to go to. There were many times that I felt like I was more spiritual I'm just being honest. And if you happen to watch the videos, brother, I just want you to know I'm not saying that I was. I thought that. I thought I was more spiritual even than many of much of the leadership. Because I felt like I knew something that they didn't know. All right. And so one of the things that I've learned is that self can do spiritual things the way it wants to instead of the way that God wants it. And it's still flesh. It's not the spirit. And sometimes it's harder to see those things. I feel like it's important because, once again, it's easy for us to recognize the parts of the flesh that we always connected to sin. But sometimes there's those little areas in our life and it's like, oh, well, it's not adultery, so it's no big deal. All right. Once again, flesh is what serves self, self-interest rather than God's interest backed by his word. I'm not here to determine if you have anything like that in your head or your heart. I'm just here to tell you that I know for a fact this type of stuff exists in Christians because I've experienced it myself, right? And while I was at the other church that I went to before, I can tell you that through the years there were some good things that were going on there. And at the same time, there were some things that I disagreed with. I'm still talking about biting and devouring, by the way. But I'm also talking about the fact that sometimes we do stuff more behind the scenes that it's not as obvious but we're doing it in the flesh to serve self or we think that we're serving the Lord with it because we think it's a spiritual thing but in reality it's not all right and I always felt like it would be best to try and openly communicate with the pastor there were things that I disagreed with and I would go to him instead of having conversations on the outside with people that were in there listen so sometimes stuff like that happens and I'm not saying I got it right all the time but I'm telling you, I was mindful of it. And I said, you know what? If I got a problem with him, I need to go to him and, he, and need to have a conversation. Sometimes I think I went to him too much, to be honest with you. But I did. I, I mean, we had a lot, a lot of conversations about that. Right. And because um, the Lord had revealed to me that it would be flesh for me to have conversations on the outside. Because what does this person even have to do with the problem that I have? If I'm over here having a conversation on the outside with someone else, guess what I'm doing? I'm influencing that person to take my way of thinking, all right? And I'm not saying that there's never a situation where that may be okay. This is all up for the Lord to deal with our hearts, right? And in addition, there were times that I would think, well, I don't like the way they're doing this or that. I'm going to send my support elsewhere. Or I will find another church to go to. I'm just telling you stuff that was in my heart. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to send my tithe check somewhere else. Or, or I'm going to go to another church. You know what the Lord said? No. First of all, the tithe ain't yours. Tithe ain't yours, son. I called you to this church. You're supposed to support this church with your tithe. You can give offerings. The, the reality of it is, is that you can give offerings above and beyond the tithe. And we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to actually teach on the tithe coming up because there's been some conversation. I taught about it in Mexico. Come to find out they got problems with it in Mexico, too. I've had conversations with people like, I just feel like that's Old Testament stuff that's lost. Stop. Hold on a second. The tithe was instituted through Abraham. The tithe is something that's specific. There's no question whether the tithe is still for today. Right? And so we'll get into that a little bit more. And you don't have to buy into it, but I'm just saying we still need to teach about it. Right? And, it's, and so I would, the Lord would tell me, no, the tithe isn't yours. It's mine to begin with. And I called you here to this local church. You're going to support this church. And you won't leave this church. Until I tell you to leave this church. Yeah. And Robert can tell you that I struggled, man. And I don't know if I stayed a little bit longer than I should have. I might have. But I got to be honest. I was fearful that I was going to miss the Lord. Yeah. Everything in me wanted to get up and actually make a scene on the way out the door. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I felt like the Lord would repeatedly tell me, I called you here for a purpose. You better know that it's my timing when it's time for you to leave. 
And, and, and that's what I'm trying to get at is that in my mind, I felt as though I was being spiritual, even more spiritual, because I was defending the gospel. And the reality of it is, is that many of the times the things that I was thinking in my heart and my mind were more flesh than they were spirit. See, G once again, Jesus didn't ask the Father. Do it, do it, do this, do that, fix it this way, then I'll go to the cross. No. G and so the question is, do we trust the Lord, amen, with what it is that we're doing? Uh, I mean, it, what you, you may have heard people talk about this before, but if the tithe belongs to the Lord, and then the next question is, and we won't get into that right now, where does the tithe supposed to go? I believe it's supposed to go to the local church. Brother Larson said it from behind his pulpit too, but that's another story for another time. That's really the only question. So where does the tithe go? The tithe is a tenth, okay? Um, but, what I'm, but what I'm trying to get at is the tithe belongs to God. And so you can't manipulate it the way that you want to. It doesn't belong to us. And, and that's just the word of God, right? And so once again, now we may not agree completely on where the tithe can go. And, and that's, you know, ultimately you won't always uh, convince folk. But I'm just trying to say that that's what I was doing in my own mind. And the Lord revealed that to me. All right. Now, let's just back up a little bit because we're talking about flesh versus spirit. And in the, in the, old, in the Bible, it talks about the fact that it uses the pig. Right? It uses the pig as something dirty. It uses the sheep as something clean. You'll never see a sheep wallowing around in mire or eating slop. However, a pig loves it. The flesh loves that, right? In, in, the, in the story of Noah and the ark, what did he send out? Two kinds of birds, right? A raven and a dove. A raven is called a carrion. What does that mean? It's a flesh eater. You know why the raven didn't come back? It found plenty of floating, bloating bodies it can light upon and eat that rotten flesh. It didn't have to come back. It had a place it could live. But the dove was clean. And it flew over and it saw that raven. I mean, I'm just adding a little bit. And then I ain't eating that. And so it came back. The second time, though, it, it was able to, you know, find a place to light, right? And so a clean place. The main point I wanted to make with that is this. The scripture said the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit lusts against the flesh. The two are contrary one to the other. There's two natures coexisting on the inside. They're at conflict with one another. Our fleshly man has fleshly appetites. Our spirit man has a spiritual appetite. The spirit of man wants to do the spiritual things of God. The fleshly man still wants to do what he wants to do that's going to make him feel good and serve his own interests. And the two of them are contrary one to the other. We got into the, I got to hustle up because I'm going to finish it. But we got into the lust of the flesh. And typically we always talk about adultery and we talk about fornication. And, you know, adultery, basically people that are married having sex with people that they're not supposed to have sex with. Fornication is essentially unmarried people having sex outside of marriage. Uh, uncleanness describes and lasciviousness, the lustfulness, and the uncleanness that's in the heart and the head. I don't know about you, but look, even after I was saved, man, dude, I was such a mess when I was in the world. God, if you could have saw my thought life, it was horrible. Even as a Christian, I mean, thank God that he did give me, I'm not saying I never think a bad thought, but I'm telling you right now, I am free in my thought life compared to what I was. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Only the Holy Spirit could have done that. You couldn't have taken that stuff out. And that's what it's talking about. You live such an unclean life for so long, and that stuff's just downloaded on the inside of you, right? But I wanted to focus a little bit on strife and seditions and heresies. These two words, seditions and, well, really mostly seditions and heresies. Sedition means division, and heresies, one of the commentators I read behind used the word click, like a church click, because it's describing divisions, we always connect it to false doctrine. And yes, false doctrine is connected to it, like in other words, but it's really about making a choice. Like in other words, I choose to associate with this group instead of that group. And it causes division. The Pharisees chose to believe a false gospel, created a false gospel, and, the, and separated people from the truth of God's word. So you see, you see the situation there. Sometimes we talk about cliques in the church. Oh, we don't have cliques, or we and we we look at it, or we have you know we might have some cliques, but it's all okay. 
I'm, only, I'm not trying to pick on this if we have clicks. I'm just trying to say we tend to gravitate towards certain people that we like to hang out with. We just have to be careful that we're not allowing it to cause division and disunity in the body of Christ. Because whenever we allow division and disunity in the body of Christ, then we're, then we're moving further away the, from the common goal of what God has, which is for us to move forward with kingdom business. Amen? So surely that makes some sense. Um, and then as far as the fruit of the Spirit, ultimately it all starts with love, right? Most scholars agree that the fruit is love and that really the rest of them are adjectives of that kind of love. Just like we could read 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter in Corinthians. And you would see a lot of commonalities between that chapter and some of these adjectives. Last week, one of them was joy, right? And last week we talked about the word blessed and how it described happiness that comes from God. It's a joy that the world can't give and the world can't take away. Amen. It's a happiness that can only be given by God. Nothing this world offers can fill the void and bring true joy to the heart of a human being other than to be in right relationship with the Lord. Amen. It doesn't matter what you go through. I mean, I'm telling you, the Apostle Paul used the word joy multiple times when he wrote Philippians and he was in a Roman prison. Right. And so I'm not saying that he never that he felt joy the whole time. I don't know. I wasn't there, but he felt enough joy to talk about it. Amen. The, the, one of the next ones I wanted to talk about was peace. Romans 5 taught us that through his sacrifice, we have peace with God. And when we're at peace with God, the spirit of God moves on our heart so that we would have peace with men. Amen. Does that make sense? Because we have peace with God, we now have access to grace. The grace of God gives us peace with men. Listen, sometimes there's frustrations and divisions and opposition, right? And the last thing our heart wants to do, come on somebody, help me out here. If you've ever been bitter towards someone, you know what I'm talking about. If you've ever been frustrated towards someone, you know what I'm talking about. And the last thing you want to do is be at peace with that person. You're frustrated with them. That's the flesh. The flesh doesn't want to submit to, to make things right. But, but yet at the same time, God is saying, and, and that's why it's a fruit of the Spirit. Because you can't just make yourself. You will now, if you ever have felt frustrated, like what I'm talking about, your face is red, you're frustrated, you, you want to get back at somebody. And I've been that way before, believe me, as a Christian. Oh, Lord. There's been times I've been so angry, I threw my phone on the ground. And I don't throw stuff really no more. I mean, I used to throw stuff, Danielle will tell you. I done broke some stuff. She got, if you ever come to visit our house, the mirror, the, the way that it's kind of like it looks, like, why is that? little vase thing in front of the mirror often is because it's hiding a crack because I threw and I slung something across the bam it was a nice mirror too I loved it I'm the one that said let's buy that mirror then I break it I hadn't thrown nothing in a while watch me go through something <laughs> anyway the point that I'm trying to make is when you frustrated like that you are not going to change your mind that's why it's called a fruit of the spirit it's the Holy Spirit that has to produce that peace amen long suffering I'm about to close Hang with me, two more. Long suffering. You knew I couldn't pass that one. And as a matter of fact, I'm not even going to beat on it too long. If, pay, if endurance is patience in circumstances, long suffering is patience in what? Relationships. Relationships. That's right. Jesus was long suffering with us. We're to be long suffering with others. That means if I did indeed aggravate you before, you're not supposed to just pick up all of your toys and go play in another sandbox. You're not supposed to just be mad at me. You're supposed to be long-suffering with me. Because trust me, I'm just saying, if I've aggravated you, you have probably aggravated me. I'm just being real. There's a good chance. And I'm over there like, hmm. You know, they think, whatever. But you know what? Long-suffering. It don't mean I don't love you. I, and I want you to love me. And when I say that, I really mean it. Right? All right. Meekness. I'm going to close with this one. We learned last week that meekness is power under control. The Spirit of God will cause us to do the right thing. Just because we can do something, we have the power to do something, doesn't mean we're supposed to exert it that way. That's one of the things that I learned. There was a great humility lesson for me at that old church. I had the power to make some decisions, and I didn't like, and I thought I was going to punish them. And then really when I stopped and thought about it, 
I mean, you might punish this church a little bit by not sending your tithe here because we're a small church. But at that church, they were, I mean, I, don't, I thought I was a big tither, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that he, they wouldn't have noticed, but it wasn't like I want to break the church. I mean, we have 650 people going over there, you know, we're bringing in at least one point, I don't know, over a million dollars a year, you know, in tithes. So it wasn't like Matt's tithe check, but I sure thought I was going to break the bank. You know, I was like, mm. anyway. <laughs> Meekness is power under control. One of the things that we learned about the Lord was is that even though he had the power to call a legion of God's angels in order to destroy the soldiers, he willingly went according to the Father's will. And there's times in our life that I do believe that we're going to find circumstances and situations that we don't like, we're not comfortable with. And the question that we really have to ask, because guess what? Maybe the Lord is telling you to do what you're doing. Right? But we have to be certain that we're hearing from the Spirit of God.